Hey, this is Chris Plush from CG Masters, and in this quick tutorial, I'm going to show you how to manually add some distortion to your texture coordinates. What we're going to be doing with that is adding a couple of knots and just general distortion to our wood object that I have here. Now, before we get started, we need to enable the Node Wrangler add on. So go to the File menu, go to User Preferences, go to the Add ons tab here, and click on the Node category. And the Node Wrangler add on pops up, so let's just left click on this checkbox there to enable it. And that's going to enable some hotkeys we'll be using throughout the tutorial that just make working with the nodes a little bit easier. Let me give you a quick rundown of how I have the nodes set up so far. So starting off on the left here, we have a wave texture node set to rings, and I increased all these values a little bit. To preview just the nodes up to this point, you can press Control, Shift, and left click on any node you want, and it connects it to a viewer node, which is pretty cool. So you can see we have some uh, hard lines in this, in this basic wave texture. So that's why I ran that through a color ramp node here. If I press Control, Shift, and left click on that, we'll see what it looks like after I've edited the color values. So to achieve these color values, I have a white color on the left side, a light gray next to that, a slightly darker gray next to that, and finally on the right side is another white color. And then I connected this color value into the bottom socket of a mix node, which I've set to multiply. So I'm multiplying the grayscale values of the color ramp on top of our base color here, which is a browny orange kind of color. And it gives us this almost cartoony looking kind of wood here, which is going to be good enough to illustrate this technique for manipulating texture coordinates. And then, of, of course, that's connected to a diffuse node here, which is connected to the material output. So this is what we have so far. And now we're going to need to add some texture coordinates for us to actually manipulate. So let's go back down to our wave texture node on the left side here. Let's left click on that and then press Control and T and it'll bring up some default mapping and texture coordinate nodes. Now the mapping nodes we can just use to change the location, rotation, and scaling of our procedural textures. But what we're going to be using, what we're going to be working with is the texture coordinate node on the left side here. So I'm going to left click and drag that to the left just to give us a little bit of room to work with. And the default is generated coordinates. Sometimes it might be better to use object coordinates and might yield a better result based on the shape of your object. But for this tutorial, I'm going to stick with generated coordinates. Now, what did the generated coordinates look like? It might be helpful to visualize it. So let's press Control, Shift, and left click on that. And you can see, once we connect that to a viewer node, the generated coordinates look like this. We have red, green, and blue values, which all combine together to give us the texture coordinates for our procedural textures. Now, this is what we're going to be manipulating. This is what we're going to be painting on top of. Now, to give you some perspective on this, check out the little axis on the bottom left of the 3D view here. You can see the x-axis is red, the y-axis is green, and the z-axis is blue. Well, it's the same thing for these generated coordinates. The red channel represents the x-axis, green channel represents y, and blue channel represents the z-axis. That's how they all come together and combine to create the texture coordinates for our procedurals. So what we're going to do now is we're going to paint a black and white image, which we're going to add on top of these generated coordinate colors and they're going to combine to allow us to manipulate the texture coordinates and distort them however we see fit. So let's press Control and Z and get rid of that viewer node. And then uh, let's add in an image texture since that's what we'll be adding on top of the generated coordinates. So press Shift and A and add a image texture node. And let's move that to the bottom there. And then press Shift and A and add a color mix RGB node and drag that on top of the line there. And let's change this to add, and let's change and let's connect this color output from the image texture node into the bottom color of the add node there. So now this is this node here is going to be adding our image texture on top of our base color here, which is our generated coordinates. And let's increase the factor to one so that it's at full strength. And you can see that it actually did change the texture. And that's because if you press Control, Shift, and left click on the image texture node. You'll see it gives us Blender's classic pink color here because we didn't actually specify an image in the image node. So this pink color is basically Blender's way of saying, hey, you forgot to add an image here because Blender's from New York apparently. So it's actually using this pink color in the add node here and adding that on top of the generated coordinates. So now I'm going to slide this window over here for the image window on the right side. I'm going to press tab over the 3D view and select all my vertices and you can see that I've already UV unwrapped the wooden plank here. And now let's add a new image while we're still in edit mode. So I'm going to click on new and change the size to 2048 by 2048. And then click on OK. 
Let's rename this to Spots. Now I'll drag that over. And let's load this image into our image texture node here by clicking on this icon and selecting Spots. And you can see that our texture now looks exactly the same as it did in the beginning. That's because we're adding a black image on top of our generated coordinates. Since there's no gray values or white values to add onto those coordinates, then it's basically like adding nothing to it. But now all of our node setup is complete. All we have to do now is paint some gray values and white values on this texture here, and they'll show up as texture manipulation or texture distortions on our object over here. So let's get started doing that now. So over in the 3D view, let's press tab and get out of edit mode. And then let's press the T key for the left side toolbar. I'm going to drag this over to give us a little bit more space. We're pretty much done with the nodes for now. And let's go into the 3D header here. And let's change the mode over to texture paint mode. Now all of our texture paint options show up on the left side toolbar here. And let's make sure our brush is on text draw. And let's see, let's keep the value, the color value at white. And I'm going to increase the scale by pressing the F key, dragging that over to scale it up. And let's see, I'll press shift and F and change the density to about 0.1. Keep it real low. It gives us more control over how much distortion we add. And let's press numpad 7 and then numpad 5 for top view orthographic. And now let's just start some painting. So I'm going to choose this kind of empty area over here and left click and drag down. And you can see the texture coordinates kind of distorting for us. And then boom, just like that, we've got a knot in the wood. It's just that simple. And let's add another one, let's say right here. We'll make this knot a little bit longer. And then we'll add one more all the way up here. So just like that, we have three knots in the wood. And maybe we'll add some on the side as well. And you can paint this on any side of the object and it's gonna have the same effect. And you can use this for more than just creating knots. You can use this to just add general distortion as well. For example, we wouldn't necessarily have knots on the wood grain on the end of the plank here, but we might not have this wood grain so consistently spaced out. So I'm gonna scale my brush up a little bit and just add a couple of sweeps through it like this to kind of drag the lines away from each other. And it's not going to add knots in the wood unless I kept clicking in that area. So if you just click a few times at a low strength value, it'll just kind of distort the wood grain a little bit. And the best part about this is that no matter how much we distort the wood grain, it's all going to align perfectly on each side of it. It's going to be seamless. And that's one of my favorite things about procedural textures. You don't have to worry about seams. I hate seams. So this was just a real quick example of how you can manipulate texture coordinates with texture paint. And I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty fun. It gives you extra degree of control over how your objects or how your procedural textures are applied to your objects. Now there's one thing I want to note is that if we were to save, if we were to go to image and then save this image to our hard drive, we'll no longer be able to paint on it in the 3D view and have it update in real time, which is a bummer. So one way around that is to go to the image menu and click on pack as PNG. That'll pack it into the blend file itself instead of on your hard drive. So it, it remains dynamic. So we'll be able to paint on this and still see it update in real time like this. And then after you make whatever other changes you want to make to it, make sure you go into the image menu and click on pack as PNG again to save the updated image information into the blend file. And also don't forget to save the blend file so that it saves the image. That's pretty much all there is to it for this. I kind of made a mess of things now. I did have a couple of good knots going, but I ruined it with extra distortion, whatever. Now I'm sure this technique has a lot of applications. Wood was kind of just obvious, so I went with that. Plus I use this technique a little on the wooden stock for my rifle for the second volume of my rifle creation series, which will be all about creating high detail and fully customizable procedural shaders for the rifle we created in volume one. This volume should be out sometime in May, so keep your eyes peeled for that. In the meantime, if you want to check out Volume 1 on modeling the rifle, you can find it at the link below. Thanks for watching, and let me know what you thought of this.